Stepping out of the elevator first, Simone sees the sparsely occupied plaza with several awaiting or arriving dignitary parties. To her amusement, she spots the one person they're here for in the midst of the largest group in heavy discourse. The most concerning and prominent individual in direct communication being the Cali ambassador. Chuck, she says softly to the princess, before tilting her head towards the gathering. What's our play? The Cali's eyes burn over her people's ambassador before landing on the squilla. I'll handle it. Otherwise we continue as planned. She replies, before beginning her stride forwards. The pack of Terrans with an accompanying beast is enough to secure the attention of most around, if not outright encourage people to get distance, just in case this isn't a cordial encounter. Such an opportunity that I hope we may discuss in a more private setting. I truly believe that what we have to offer your people is something worth... The elderly female Cali ambassador speaks, before the Squilla turns away to look at those approaching. Following the line of sight, the elder Cali takes a few instinctual steps back, before finding enough resolve to hold her ground. You dare parade yourself in Central, like some consorting dishonored barbaric delinquent, before staining this political floor with your presence? She spits in a venomous tone at the princess. Surely name-calling is above someone of your station, Ambassador Cheek Trasser. Or has my father amended the criteria for representative qualifications to such a pitiful level? How so very sad for our people if that's the case, the princess replied, without so much as giving the other Cali a millisecond of a glance, instead addressing the Squilla directly. Thank you for meeting with me, Ambassador. Do you have a preferred designation to refer to you as for our talks? The Cali ambassador's eyes go wide in shock at what the princess is saying, and looks to the Squilla to witness the response. The Squilla's upper torso twists in order for his unmoving four eyes to look at the princess. Greetings, Chakalata Mortaz. I have accepted Kaz as my verbal name. I understand my people are unique in our method of communication through pheromones alone. The ambassador says, in an artificially projected voice from a translating device attached to the side of his head. Indeed. I always find it so exciting to learn what makes every species uniquely beautiful. It's lovely to meet you, Ambassador Kaz. May we escort you and your security detail to the meeting proper? Chuck says pleasantly. You will do no such thing! The Cali Ambassador snaps before stepping closer to the squiller. Ambassador Kaz, with all due respect, I urge you to stay as far away from this dangerous criminal as possible. I don't know what they did to persuade you, but I assure you that they are not the sort you wish to associate with, as they seek to take advantage of you and your people. I understand that you are still blissful to such things. Stop speaking, the translated voice of the Squilla orders sternly. Believe it or not, I and my people understand being taken advantage of. Just because we are new to the stars doesn't mean our experienced history and the lessons we've learned are magically erased at worth. If I am to understand your laws, to which I've studied thoroughly, I am free to meet and speak with who I choose at my discretion. If they intend harm to me, then I will concede to the consequences and allow the enforcers of law to do their jobs. Ambassador, this is someone who is a great threat and enemy of my people. If you make any political deals with her, you may very well make an enemy of the Kelly people as a whole. I hope you can see my urgency in warning you. Cheek Trasser chirps in a darker tone. Andrist, ostracization with the rest of Central? Please, Ambassador, there is no need to allude to threats and throwing a fit over matters that reside outside your duties to the Kelly people. Now excuse us, we have a private meeting to attend to, Chuck says, as she turns to walk with Cass. Insolent terramating aberration harlot! You have no political pull by any stretch of Kratz's twisted gifts! The only reasonable conclusion of your presence is to terrorize and derail galactic progress. For the good of the stars and the prosperity of all, we'll take you into custody here and now. Crack! The elder Cali staggers back unsteadily, as her consciousness is momentarily stunned, causing her two guards to reach for their weapons. But with the loud growling snarl of his room, they freeze up before escalated conflict can occur. 
giving her head a slight recovering shake. Chuck glares towards the elder Callie. Touch me or those in my company, and I'll happily cross the lines of central decorum to enact a small modicum of justice for my slain family. I no longer fear you, or have an ounce of respect for you or what you're clearly masquerading as. You don't represent our people or their future. Just a puppet frau for whatever my father's greed and insanity demands. You're ashamed to your family, ancestors, and to every living Kali needing you to be better. The princess states, before giving the Squilla an apologetic bounce. I apologise for the scene, Ambassador Cass. I'm afraid Kali politics are in a rather rough patch at this time. Reaching up, the older Kali felt one of her long horns, only for it to remove itself from her scalp. Confused shock grasps her core as she processes what the princess dared to do to a Kali official. By the time her inner rage spikes up, she feels her guards take hold of her arms and lead her away from the group of clearly dangerous Terrans. Allowing her own security team to keep an eye on things, Chuck fully addresses the Squilla as they walk him and his own pair of robotic security drones towards the walkway. I once again apologise. But it is how Kelly assert dominance in strange social settings, she explains. I am not offended by your actions. I have read much of the recent events in hopes to familiarise myself as much as possible. Frankly, unless I'm missing something vital with central law, I don't understand why Central has yet to condemn the Kelly King and not recognise his position as illegitimate, Cass responds. Oh, well I believe it's fair to say that I'm with you on that. Technically, they ought to have sent central fees to render my father from power immediately. However, sometimes bureaucracy and self-serving ambitions cast the laws aside. Granted, the Kelly are free to choose who leads them and how to structure their own personal government, but this being a successful military coup complicates things. My father has the Kelly military's full support, which means a drawn-out conflict for central, regardless of the odds of victory. Since the rest of the royal family was eradicated, it brings up the next complication of who would replace him. I was not fully confirmed to have survived until recently, as you may know, so although I'm a candidate for such action, my father has had the time to further entrench himself and construct more defensive fleets. As long as he does not further provoke Central, they will delay any meaningful action for as long as they can get away with. No doubt other species are benefiting from new arrangements with him as well. Chuck elaborates. The Squillers arachnid-like mandibles, flitter in thought. How unfortunate. I empathise with you and your people, Princess, Cass says, as his very trooper-like blue soft torso arms wrap together in his front. Thank you. I do very much appreciate you accepting this meeting. I'd go into further detail to better prepare you, but it's honestly best if we wait for all to hear. I understand, Cass assures. As they traverse, Simone eyes the Squilla security drones uneasily. No matter what happens, it's essential that the machines don't cause further issues from misunderstandings. Plus, they are a practical guarantee that privacy from Central would be a pipe dream. Activating her lens, she confirms that Devon is keeping Thorn in the loop regarding the drones via the secure group message chat. Glancing back at the new species, Simone curiously draws general comparisons between the Squilla and Truba. There is a vague overall shape similarities from the waist up, and they both have nearly identical upper soft limbs with fuzzy tufts as physical manipulators. But other than that, there's not much to compare. Both species have four eyes, with two large primary and two small secondary eyes. However, where the Trubas are glowing white, Squillas are dark and more bulbous. Truba have a mouth that is more familiar to a Terran compared to a Squilla's, which resemble that of an arachnid or crustacean. The most blatant differences between the two being that Truba practically float upon their mass of flowing downward tendrils, while Squilla only have four lower limbs and, other than the upper limbs, are encased in a thick shell of chitin. The Squilla before her walks on two bipedal chitin armored legs, but it seems that a second pair of adapted limbs that were once another pair of legs casually fold over his thighs with pointy, grasping pincers dangling down to his knees. Although the pincers pale in comparison to the ones the Malkite sport, they definitely look like they could do some damage if needed. In fact, the vibe she picks up from this bean is that he is far from fragile, 
even compared to the majority of other non-Defor species. Simone starts to wonder if Central will eventually class Squilla as Death Worlders, before she feels Brandy tap her shoulder. Looking to her friend, the woman nods ahead to redirect the redhead's attention as they step out to a transport shuttle bay. Down the ways, boarding a large shuttle, is another group of uniformed Terrans. However, they are dressed in Union garb. Simone is only able to catch the briefest glimpse of the President's back, before the rest of the accompanying security enters behind and closes the door. The redhead continues to watch as the Union shuttle lifts and departs for the Grat Embassy, the feeling of this is really happening striking her chest. That's a lot of security, Troy messages. Did you not see? The Terran ambassador is with her, did we not expect that? Brandy replies in the group chat. He was supposed to be preoccupied with his day-to-day -day work. Of course they are expected to meet up before getting to business, but he seems to want to be there for the meeting, Devon informs. We're already messing with the president. Might as well add the damn ambassador. Not like the fallout is going to be any different if things go bad for us. But speaking of which, do we have any intel on the guy? Last thing we need is a hark on pawn destroying this whole thing right off the bat. Simone messages, as the group stops to wait for their own shuttle to arrive. I have already gone through his records, public and private. Nothing stands out as too clean or dirty. Was arrested once in his twenties after a bar scuffle, and has been amicably divorced once. He has little to no direct connections with the Admiral, only been in the same physical places as him twice. Both been official government functions. Honestly, he's highly unlikely to be involved unless he's a lifelong agent for Harkon. Dev encounters. With the people we're up against, that wouldn't surprise me one bit, Simone points out. Fair, and regardless, we need to ensure he's not going to be a problem of any kind. With him present on top of the president, it's going to get extra difficult to separate them from their security. Like it or not, this may get... more hands-on, Devin replies, just as their shuttle lands and opens for their entry. Simone bites her cheek as an idea comes to mind. After everyone enters and takes their seat, she excuses herself to stand apart from everyone else to make a private call. Terran Embassy, you've reached Foreign Service Officer Sandy, Bree's voice answers. Hey Bree, it's me, Simone says, with a clearing of her throat. Ah, yes, how can I be of assistance today? Bree replies, in a maintained professional tone, that indicates others of importance are within overhearing range. The redhead sighs as she rubs the space between her eyes. I see. All right. The princess is curious if the Terran ambassador is busy at the moment, she ends up saying. By the request of President Bernal, Ambassador Howard Lee will be in attendance at the Grat Embassy. I apologise on his behalf for not forwarding a proper notification to the Kali princess, as the Grat have taken priority to notify, as they are the host. Is there anything I can relay to the ambassador for you? Bree replies. No, that's all. Thank you, Simone says with a nod, wanting to limit this call as much as possible, to avoid her old friend from getting into trouble. Very well. May the stars guide you. Bree farewells, before the call ends. Turning back to the group, Simone sends another message to the chat. Bernal invited him along. That's at least a little assuring, she updates. Makes sense if she caught wind that more species than expected were attending. The ambassador is pretty good at his job and is more plugged into things around here, Brandy responds. Nodding at that, the redhead looks over at Chak, who was sharing idle chit-chat with Kaz. Currently, she was showing off her new deep-dye chitin tattoos and giving an earnest recommendation of the joint she received it from. So, is it permanent markings? We decorate our shells with burn scarrings that last until it molts off, Kaz inquires. Oh, well, technically it is, but it can be removed by dyeing the chitin back to its natural colour, and molting most likely will greatly diminish the colour, if not eventually remove it completely. Still, I think it's certainly worth doing anyway, Jack answers. Indeed, the colours are marvellous. I can see it catching on with my people to express ourselves, akin to how the shellless naturally do. We can do so as well, but it can only be viewed right after the state of molting. 
Shellless? Oh, you mean the Truba? Chuck asks. Yes, apologies. Referring to them as something other than what we've designated them as for generations is tricky to do. Whether it be out of resentment or habit, Cash replies. As much as I hope to find a way to coexist as equals, it is difficult to not be bitter. As I've come to understand, the general population of Shellless did not even know we existed, and are just as angered at the long-kept atrocity. Apparently, any knowledge of us was in historic museums, presented as though we were an extinct cousin species. Oh, wow. Have there been any success in integrating the two peoples? Or is their intent to remain separated? The princess questions curiously. There's obviously trepidation in every direction. Once the trooper leadership is resolved and replaced, I am certain there will be Squilla deciding to attempt to live in the Upper Ocean Society. Though many will wish to remain, and many others wish to leave for the stars. The Squilla ambassador answers. Apologies for all these questions, but I can't help but be curious. You seem to not need assistance to breathe the standard oxygen atmosphere. Don't your people dwell far below in the ocean depths? The Kali says. Underground volcanic cave networks to be precise. There are entire open air ecosystems contained in many of the larger caves. Nothing as vibrant as what I've witnessed from seen images of other worlds, but open air is not alien to us. I see. Well, is there anything you'd like to know about the Kelly people? Or the Terrans, or Grat, perhaps? Chuck offers. Not needed. I've been studying most of the other species and their available histories in depth, so that I am as familiar and capable as possible. But perhaps at a later time we may discuss more in depth nuances. Cass responds pleasantly. Of course. You are certainly proficient at your ambassador role. The princess nods. Thank you. Ever since I was chosen by the eldest of my people, I've been working to not disappoint. The squiller replies genuinely. The rest of the flight goes by without incident. However, the group receives a direct message from Thorn, as their shuttle descends to land at the Grat Embassy. Almost hit a critical snag, smoothed out. Liz Alas is almost in position. Copy that, we're landing now. Everyone, start streaming your lenses view, Devlin instructs, to which everyone complies. Perfect. Everyone knows their role, let's not cause any wars. The shuttle door slides open, to the sound of Terrans and Grat in idle discussion, but already the majority of the voices dwindle to almost completely silence to welcome the newcomers. Stepping out first, Troy and Brandy take positions on either side of the door in a form of presentation. They look out to the intimidatingly large group of at least a dozen Union Terrans, eight of which are lightly armed at the hip and adorned in incorporated protective materials in their security uniforms. Each and every one from their posture and demeanour exude professionalism and heartily tested experience. The others, who are not clearly armed, include the President, Ambassador and two aides. When Chuck steps out with the Ambassador Kaz, she immediately clocks one of the aides being the very recently familiar face of Bree. Oh, here we go, she whispers to herself, feeling this whole situation is getting more and more complicated by the minute. But she continues moving towards the group with her dog at her side, noticing the pack of Union security tensing up upon Simone exiting the craft behind her. President Bernal stands next to the Grat Ambassador and gives the arriving party a studious look over as they approach. She's a woman in her forties, dressed in a sharp black and blue formal suit. Her dark, medium-length curly fur frames a stern yet curious expression. Crossing both of her arms behind her back, she steps forward to meet the Cali, though clearly her security didn't like her doing so. Princess Chocolatimotaz, it's a pleasure to finally make your acquaintance. Funny how our paths have not crossed, despite our cooperation to uplift the Grat people, no? She greets, in a naturally authoritative tone. The pleasure is all mine, Madam President. Indeed, I believe today's discussions will be fruitful for not only the Grat people, but for all parties involved. Chuck bounces respectfully. I must say, however, the company you keep is rather curious. 
I'd congratulate you on your betrothal, but unfortunately she happens to be a noted war criminal that would be arrested if ever caught in Union space. For the sake of keeping the peace, I will not have her apprehended for the duration of this meeting, but I can't promise action in the future, Bernal informed sternly. Chuck straightens her posture and returns a firm stare, one that few Terrans had ever seen from Akali directly. On the contrary, she is no criminal. A side discussion I hope to have would be for you to give her an official pardon, clearing her name. She and I have the evidence for you to review of her innocence. It's very compelling evidence, and that should only be shared in a private and secure setting, she counters, with fiercely glowing eyes. Visibly surprised by this behaviour, Burnack takes a moment to glance between the two women. Then consider me curious to see it, she acknowledges, for focusing on the Squilla. Ambassador Cass, I must admit I was rather excited to learn of your attendance today. Despite having been sought after by every nation in one way or another, I feel this gathering is one of grand importance for the Squilla people. I hope I'm correct, Cash replies with their automated voice. Lifting her eye tufts, Bernal nods once. Considering this meeting is an absolute nightmare for so many political parties here in Central, at the very least it will be interesting, she replies with a soft grin. I've already received quite a few... Discouraging messages and calls from a few member species, so let's try not to splinter things more than necessary. Ambassador Howard Lee speaks up, with a respectful nod of his head to the newcomers. Simone bites her cheek at that, knowing what is to come. The Terran ambassador is tall and lanky in stature, a good foot taller than any of the other present Terrans. His dark, short, grey head fur is well kept and sharply refined, while his sharp, narrow blue eyes are banded by a natural shadow, brought on from years of poor sleep. Central will do as Central does when the Union does anything, but I don't envy your position, Ambassador. Bernal grunts before turning to the Grat. I believe this is everyone, yes? Or are we to wait for the Wataf and Zartuk Ambassadors as well? They will join us after our own discussions, Grat Ambassador Jeevan assures in well-practiced galactic standard, before waving his guests to follow him into the embassy proper. The on-foot convoy is immediately intense and awkward, as Terran glances from both sides eye one another, keeping vigil over the other for any hint of hostility. However, Troy can't help but to divert his gaze over the premises as he enters and walks down the welcoming hallway. Everything is pristine once again, and among the screens of the Grat homeworld and presented elements of their history and culture is a new addition. A centre statue of moulded volcanic obsidian glass. His eyes instantly recognise two of the seven figures, standing atop a base that was higher up than his own height. Miki and Nodrin, each standing proudly and facing in defiance towards the embassy entrance, as though protecting it from an unseen force. As he passes it, he reads the hard light panel projected at the front of the statue's base. This stands in honouring those who defended and sacrificed for the Grat's future among the stars. We will remember in gratitude the heroic fallen, and those who still stood after such a tragic senseless attack upon our embassy. We will endure together, we will fall together. It's the Grat way. Below that is a list of names of the Grat, who perished in the recent assault to eliminate the Grat Ambassador. No direct mention of his Grat duo, however, despite their visages being used as well. Makes sense, though. From what he understands, the Grat revere their ancestors, and the spirits of those who've died. Miki and Nodrin are still very much around, and hopefully their names won't be added to this list for a very long time. Continuing on, the group walks into the semi-large lounge. Freshly refurbished and repaired, no one can spot a single blemish of battle. Instead, an array of relaxed working grat briefly pause their day-to-day -day jobs to observe the large group of mostly Terrans. Chuck knows the swift repairing of the embassy, as Central doing everything they can to appease and apologise for allowing such an event to occur. No doubt the grat had been given other boons to help smooth things over, Connections, trade deals, and perhaps even donations of technology for their homeworld. 
Nodrin and Miki stand side by side in front of the entrance to Jeevan's office, blocking the way. Raising a hand, Nodrin looks to Jeevan directly. Apologies, Ambassador. This is more armed individuals than our security expected. We request only two security personnel per representative to enter, they say in pristine galactic standard. Jeevan, seeming to not have suspected this, gives the two a trusting nod before turning to the Union President, first and foremost. Is that agreeable, Madam President? It is true I was not expecting this degree of security. It is not a matter of distrust, I assure you, but after recent events, I hope you understand our apprehension, he says. One of Bernal's guards leans in and whispers something into our ear, to which she waves him away. I understand, of course. May one of mine first inspect the office space? Just for peace of mind. Your own security is encouraged to oversee, of course, she replies. Jeevan looks over to the two guarding Grat, deferring to them to make the call. That is acceptable, Miki grants with a nod, before opening the door and stepping in for the chosen Union Terran to enter. Without needing Bernal's selection, a female Terran steps forward and enters the office. Without a moment of hesitation, she moves to the large meeting table with seating all around it. One by one, she scans and visually checks under every seat. Then Miki gets closer to her as she ventures towards the ambassador's repaired desk. It's the very same one that Miki was smashed down onto, but in a bit of artistic symbolism, has been fixed by putting all of the shattered pieces together with dark, semi-transparent resins, only truly opaque for the private drawers. Please seal the window shutters, the Terran instructs, after she gives the wooden desk a look over. Yes, Miki agrees, as she moves to the other side of the desk and presses onto a hard-like console. With minimal navigation, she ensures that the transparent windows close up via layered and locking metallic sheets that scroll down and over. The beautiful view is completely obstructed, but after a few more various scans, the Union Terran seems to be as satisfied as she can be. Without so much as a farewell, she steps back out to the President. All clear, she simply updates before stepping aside. Simone has to fight the urge to let out a relieved sigh, knowing that things can still turn on a dime at any moment. Excellent. I hope you understand that with two Union representatives, we'll each be bringing our own separate security teams with us. Also, our unarmed staff will be joining. Bernal drops on the Grat Ambassador. Nordrin nearly speaks up to try to dissuade that prospect, but can't justify a strong enough response that won't sound suspicious. That's acceptable, they concede, trying to sound unbothered by it. Four highly trained Terrans to contend with. Better than eight, I suppose, Simone thinks to herself, as everyone begins to funnel into the office and find their preferred seats. Troy, Brandy and Devin remain behind in the lounge, as Room takes up the second slot of the princess's security presence. Chuck sits fairly close next to Jeevan, who's straight across from the president, while Kaz decides to take a more distant and observant seat at the head of the table. Each pair of security personnel stand directly behind their charge, hovering in the case of the Squillers' drones, and the room falls silent for a moment, as thoughts are gathered. Once the entrance door seals shut, Bernal laces her fingers and eyes the Cali first and foremost. You've done a lot to modify what was supposed to be a simple meeting to discuss Terran and Grad relations moving forward. Of which I'm more than willing to address, of course, but first I'd like to be further clued in on what your intentions are. Since stepping hoof in Central, you have caused quite the ruckus, despite having covered your tracks very professionally, considering the blandness of your involvement. I'm hoping today won't be another unfortunate incident she states. The princess freezes for a moment, but quickly recovers to respond. You are well informed, though I must point out that I'm a target for a lot of people. Even in Central I find myself in many, unfortunately perilous situations. As you can imagine, such has been my life in recent years. But you have my word that I only bring the best of intentions to this meeting, and a lot to say for you to hear, she says earnestly. You have certainly put in the effort to have my ear, and quite a few others as well. So, let's get down to it then. What is this meeting really about? 
Burnal questions. Chuck shifts in her seat, giving apologetic looks to both the Grat and Squiller ambassadors. I believe the represented peoples in this room, and those who are to arrive soon, have much to offer one another. In fact, I know it's of immeasurable galactic importance to come together. Pardon, Howard interjects. With all due respect, is this primarily regarding your people, Princess? Flower up the language all you want, but I think it's safe to assume you're here seeking armies and fleets to take back your world. Or am I mistaken? Chuck hooks her lower arms under the table, tidily. That is a secondary goal of mine in these discussions, yes. But I'm afraid the scope is far larger than a mere war with my people. Far, far larger. I understand that asking the Union for military aid must be incredibly tiring to you, as that is currently your most valuable commodity, she says. But in order to address everything I like to, there's some important ground to cover. First, the future relationship between the Grat, Squilla, and Terran nations, she says, before turning to Kaz. Apologies if this has been something you've been hounded on by most others, but your people have been noted to be incredible engineers practically unparalleled, despite having not ventured into the stars until recently. It is a fact that my people have been hailed as such. However, I'm concerned that our prowess is overblown to be flattering. It is clear that many indeed seek our people out to be cheap yet effective labourers, but they all fail to fully understand that our accommodations require us to be separate from one another to a comparatively significant degree. Our history is wrought with many overpopulation travesties, that we wish to avoid at all costs, even when presented with the endless void of space, Kaz replies. Apologies. I don't mean to allude to labour work. I specifically mean engineering. You have great minds that once introduced to new technologies can very possibly improve upon them. Such minds would be vital for the Grat's uplifting in both fields of education and advancing their developed societies to a comparable level with as little negative systematic disruption as possible, Chuck says, before looking to the two Terran representatives. And similarly for the Union, it's no secret that your focus on military growth has left your other industries lacking at best and gradually degrading at worst. With each passing standard year you release more and more colonies from your protection, why not allow other species such as the Squilla to lend assistance in development teams? As for more labour-oriented work, I propose contacting deals with the Grat. Given the proper education, I see the Grat's potential easily filling the weak points the Union County stands with in regards to manpower. Imagine not having to limit your colony outreach with more individuals working in ships, maintaining colonies and any general industry. In turn, the Grat and Squilla both receive secure work, colonies to inhabit, a shorter time adjusting and spreading across the stars, and build their economies while also positively augmenting the unions. Details can be hammered out, of course, but such an alliance would be incredible in theory. But now when Howard, to their credit, fully listens to what the Kali is proposing, as well as the other two ambassadors, but neither Terran looks remotely convinced by the end of her proposal. In theory, certainly. A few major problems immediately spring to mind, however, Howard says first. Firstly, it places the Union in an unfair position to both Squilla and Grat, both politically and socially. It may seem that the Union wouldn't care as long as it benefits, but we are not interested in placing other nations under some sort of vassalship. Not only would that further alienate us from Central, but it would also stump future prospects for the Grat and Squilla. Secondly, the Squilla currently don't have a firm state of a wholly unified government, and it was a struggle to construct what they currently have, as they show little interest in doing so. Which means it would mean effectively offering full Union citizenship to another species. Something that hasn't been done to such a proposed degree before. Chuck and Simone feel a shift in the air, as their plan comes ever closer to his apex. For your first point, that is why I've invited the Wataf and Zar Tuk to join in on later discussions. They have just as much to benefit from not only these new species, but the Union as well. Such a grand alliance would be unheard of outside Central itself. Howard stifles a scoff, clearing his throat to cover it. I'm afraid there's too much bad blood there. 
Generations of conflict tend to do that, princess. He manages to say politely. Sonla, you're on. Simone messages through her lens. Frankly, you won't have a choice, Ambassador. None of us will. To your second point, it's time that the Union starts allowing the stars in, or stand alone in what's to come, Chuck asserts. This places an uncomfortable look across all of the Union Terran faces. Bree specifically locks eyes with Simone for the first time since this second meetup. Care to clarify that, Princess? Bernal asks cautiously. Chuck takes a deep breath before intensely staring directly at the Union President. My father is planning on going to war against the rest of the peoples of the galaxy. He has amassed secret fleets that although still most likely can't directly rival the Unions or Centrals, but he won't be alone, not by a long shot. In fact, there's others, planning to undermine the Union and destabilize Central. The universe is about to undergo the largest war ever waged in all of history, and it's imperative that we stop it from happening, or prepare the best we can, she reveals. A force of tremendous magnitude that will outclass the Union and Central combined, and we can prove it, but we're going to need your direct involvement, Madam President, she reveals, just before the two drones behind Kaz deactivate and crash to the ground. Immediately, the four Union security personnel draw their weapons and pull back the representatives in a protective formation. The door won't open, and your comms are blocked. Simone speaks for the first time. Within the very walls of the embassy, a cramped Farouk welded the inner mechanisms for the door completely shut. Even if one was to try to manually open or attempt to hack the controls, it would take nothing short of breaching explosives to enter the office. What is this? What's going on? McGrath Ambassador panics. Everything will be fine. As long as the president does one thing for me, Simone says, as she starts to walk around the table, to the great chagrin of Bernal security. They shout at the redhead, as they aim plasma weapons directly at her head and chest. Others desperately attempt to hammer on the door to call for help. Too bad for them, during the renovations the door was installed with state-of-the-art noise-cancelling privacy technology. Stop! Just stop! Bernal commands in a mix of anger, confusion and fear. Holding her hand up to everything that is going on, before pointing at Simone. What is it? What do you want? I want you to take my hand and accept what I give you. Everything will be explained in more detail than we could ever attempt. You won't be harmed, and I know this is insane, but I think you'll understand why. It's almost impossible to believe otherwise, and I am not willing to risk you not believing us. Is that important? Simone replied in a calm, almost tranquil tone. I'm not touching you with a ten-foot pole. I want you to explain, now. Bernal orders firmly. Simone bit her cheek, but gives a subtle nod. A species known as the Minarians has the whole galaxy virtually surrounded. They have fleets of devastating ships, world-breaking weapons, and technology far ahead of anything the rest of this galaxy has. They intend on invading and conquering, we are all screwed, but it might make an actual difference if the stars were more united. In my hand is proof that what I'm saying is all true, because honestly anything else I can give you or say can be fabricated to some degree, or at best not properly convey the scope of it all, she says, as she reaches out a close fist. If you need a push, something that will tell you that there's something to what I'm saying, just look at this. Activating her lens, Simone projects a broadcasted image to the wall next to the Terrans. It's of Jamie, sitting on the ground while eating a slice of pizza, dangerously close to sending his gifted dino pyjamas with grease. To Simone, it warms her heart, but to most others, it instills an unexplainable sense of fear and dread. That's a Minarian. You feel that? An irrational fear of something that would be normally harmless and adorable? They made sure you'd feel that way. Take my hand, Bernal, please. The galaxy as we know it depends on you, Simone says, before tilting her head towards her outstretched hand. An array of thoughts and feelings visually crash and stir within the President's mind, as well as her company. But only breaks this state to say something. Do it, ma'am. 
Bernal and Howard zip their heads towards Bree. What? Bernal questions, as if the world has gone insane. Simone is a good person, and she's not a war criminal. If I'm wrong, I fully understand that I'll get arrested for my involvement and further face consequences. I know I won't see my child again, but I trust her to be right. Even though I frankly have no idea what's going on, I trust her. Take her hand, Madam President. Brie encourages, with a terrified, shaking voice. A Union security guard takes hold of Bree by the arm, and forces her away from the representatives, but Simone stands firm. After a few moments, Bernal lets out a harsh sigh. Fuck it, she states, in a tone that didn't quite match her usual disposition. Swatting away a guard's attempt to pull her back, she marched right up and took Simone's hand, without giving herself a chance to think twice. Relieved tears break free from the redhead's emerald eyes, as she passes on the vermis worm in her hand, allowing it to burrow into the president's skin. Thank you, she says softly. <laughs>